Thank you for coming to this uh, Center for International Policy Studies event. Our guest today is Robert Henry. Robert is, has a doctorate from the University of Saskatchewan uh, from the Indigenous Studies Department, and he now teaches at, uh, in sociology at University of Calgary. Um, he's been there for two years. He has continued to work on, I believe this is part of the thesis, right? Is it? No, no, okay, so he has written this book along with the people who are in it, and it is, in a sense, photo and, and speech essays about written by the people who are in the book. He has worked with uh, Indigenous gang members, and this is the output, seems to be the output of that. And if you want, you can Google search him, and you can find an interview done by Global global television, right? Uh, where uh, Robert and one of the writers in the book is uh, talks about the experience of the book. Uh, the book features the voice of nine indigenous men and women who were either gang members or former gang members and talks about their experiences, talks about their life. It is it is really hard to find, so if you could give us information on how to get it, that would be great. In August of last year, he arranged a symposium, it was an international comparative symposium on indigenous street gangs, and the work that he's going to be presenting today draws on that along with his other work. So he's going to be talking about indigenous street and gang violence in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And I will Pass this around so you can have a sense of what it's like. And you get to start. I, I, I think I can speak Perfect. loud enough. Okay. Be good enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not that many people. It's all good. Mm -hmm. It's a nice room to be speaking in. So, uh, thank you for that, uh, that introduction. Um, before I begin, I'd also like to recognize that we're sitting on unceded Algonquin territory. Um, and I don't do this as a checkbox. And I don't like universities that do this as a checkbox to say that this is what we're doing. I do this because it's part of building relationships. That if we're going to actually reconcile, then we just can't use a checkbox. We actually have to understand what that means when we say we are on unceded Algonquin territory. And we get to rework that relationship together. Um, and so I will quickly go through this. I'm going to give you a little bit of background who I am because where I'm from, I was always taught that you have to tell people who you are and where you come from because if not, how can people know where you got your knowledge from or how you've come to understand your space. So I am Métis, I'm in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. I was um, born in Prince Albert. My family, my mother and father decided that they didn't want to live in the city of Prince Albert and so we moved just 8 miles, 12 miles east of the city towards the forks uh, and I went to school in an all-white farming community uh, that was out there. I'm white skin so this actually helped me out there. One of the things that happened when I was growing up out there was my parents told me to not tell anybody that you're Métis because the only Aboriginal kids in that neighborhood or in that community were those who were in the child welfare system uh, and foster kids and those were the individuals who actually could not go to other people's homes because they were seen as thieves or dirty and so in order for us to actually be able to have a community there my parents strictly told us do not tell anybody that you are Métis but going into the city uh, because my parents work shift work that's where I understood the ideas of what kin relationships are within Métis communities because my grandpa had 21 brothers and sisters and they all stayed within Prince Albert so if you can imagine that for a second having 21 brothers and sisters in one neighborhood uh, and then have all of their kids and grandkids in that neighborhood as well. That's what we did. We ran and got into trouble in one house and we would run out of that house, run across, and then go into another house. <laughs> eat the food all there, then run out of that house and go into the next house. And that's the type of community that we grew up in. And so, really, if you look at what we were doing back in the day, we were uh, minor vandalism, if you will. Uh, breaking down fences, running around, causing trouble. Uh, if you will, and everybody knew who we were. We were the Henrys, the Fiddlers, the Van Bells, and the Macaws. That was our family. And so, but we never understood ourselves to be anything else but 
family. We understood who we were. We, we came to understand all of that. Oh, before we get going, um, I have, so when we look at corrections, and we'll go back through the, all of this, I'm a graduate of SUNTEP, Saskatchewan Urban Native Teachers Education Program. It's an all Aboriginal program for teachers. And the goal is, is they wanted more teachers to be teaching in the public education system um, because they thought that more teachers would increase the attention or the retention of Indigenous students. And we see that that kind of happens, but it doesn't really happen. Um, and so there's some issues that are in there. But with SUNTAP, what it is is that you're actually with, you're learning about who Métis is, uh, what it is to be Métis, and you're building that community again. And for some individuals, this is a good thing for them because they have to disregard their Métis identity um, and are trying to refine it again. So I was there, went through SUNTAP. Uh, I have two younger brothers. They are, uh, one's a police officer. He was the youngest officer ever in Edmonton police history. We hired on at 19 years old. Way too young for any police officer, in my opinion. I don't think police officers should be hired until at least 25 plus uh, for a lot of reasons, but I won't get into that today. Uh, my other brother is a uh, hand guard out at Drum Heller, and he does the emergency response training for Western Canada for the federal institution. So, again, the trouble, he puts me in an arm bar, I'm on the ground, I don't know what to do. Um, my dad has 37 years of corrections. He started as a correctional officer. He now uh, was working with the Department of Justice in restorative justice. He was pushing Indigenous uh, First Nations Métis communities in restorative justice and moving those youth programs. And my mom's a nurse. I beat my mom to a degree. She was grandmothered in. She had a, um, uh, not a degree, she had a diploma in nursing back in the 1970s. So I actually am the first person in my family to have a uh, education degree. When I was doing my education, I ended up finding a master's program because I did my internship in New Zealand. And all of this will make sense for you here in a second. Just wait, it'll make sense. And so, so this master's program saw that you could go and do two years at the University of Hawaii, two, univers two years at the University of Saskatchewan, and I wanted to go surfing. So I applied, not knowing what it was, and I got in, and then the program fell through. And then I got stuck in the Northern uh, Education Program at the University of Saskatchewan. But it's here where my framework of understanding how society works began to frame. We had to be created, and that was because I was working with uh, Indigenous women scholars, such as Verna St. Dennis, Marie Batiste, Margaret Kovach, Alex Wilson, and Carla Williamson. And if you are in education, those five names will run through in Indigenous education, from multicultural education to critical and suppressive education, and all the way through. So that's who, where my training began. My interest in street gangs uh, began prior when I was 19. I was playing hockey, playing junior hockey, like all great Canadian kids, and I ended up fighting my coach and quitting hockey, even though I had a scholarship in the United States. Uh, so I quit, and my auntie, um, because in Prince Albert, where I'm from, there's a couple jobs. You can be a teacher, because of SUNTEP, so thank you SUNTEP. Uh, you can be a prison guard, or work in the correctional system, because it's the city of jails, you have a federal institution, you have a provincial institution, you have a youth institution, you have a women's institution. Uh, you can be a nurse, because the nursing program for indigenous uh, people are there, or you're behind bars. <coughs> so those are the directions that my family had. Uh, so when I came back from hockey in 2000, this is where we see a shift within the prairies on the idea of street games. The term began to be used at nine, when I was 19, and what happened is, none of you are familiar with Prince Albert? I like drawing and moving, so it's okay. So, take Prince Albert, it's a perfect graph, and what it is. So you have the East Hill, West Hill, East Flat, and this is how we call it in the West Lot, and it's all in this sort of thing. My family primarily lived here and a little bit over here, but definitely they live up there. So when we look at the hill, there's a hill that divides the city. When you're on top of the hill, you have these million dollar houses that look over top, beautiful landscape, northern landscape. You take one step off the sidewalk and look down, and the roads underneath them aren't paved. There's, the homes are $20,000, it's a lot of poverty. So, when I was working at the school, it was in the, in the West Flat, it was called Queen Mary Community School. And this is where the teachers were beginning to become afraid of the gang problem that was happening. So, they brought in the police officers, which I guarantee you, you take the police officers there, you can take the police officers from Ottawa, Toronto, everything else, and they say, if you give us a gang, tell us what's going on with gangs, it'll probably all be the same. We'll just take the individuals they're focusing on out. 
So they gave a generic thing. Uh, gangs don't stay here because in, on the prairies, nobody stayed on the prairies during this time, in the early part of 2000. People just kind of came and left. And they had the same idea around the street gangs. But what was interesting was they said, when the, they asked them, well, who do we look for? Like, how do we identify these gang members from these other gang, non-gang members in our school? And they said, well, it's these kids wearing a baby blue New York Yankees hat backwards to the side a little bit. And if any of you remember back in the day, that's when the New York Yankees were beginning to uh, rebrandish themselves. And all sports teams began to rebrand themselves with different colors and everything. And I asked the question, I said, okay, what about the kids on the East Hill? White, upper middle class, because they're all wearing those hats too. Nope. What about the West Hill? Nope. What about the East Flat? Mm, nope. Any hum? I said, so basically you're saying that it's just the kids on the West Flat? Yes, because those are the kids that commit the crimes. And those kids there are Aboriginal with low socioeconomics. But that's also my cousins. And my cousins were wearing those hats. And I was like, they're not in a gang. But yet the police officers were going through there and they would say, here you go. So that's where my interest came into street gangs. How are we actually defining gangs? What's going on with all of that? So that was my master's work. And then I got into a PhD program. And again, I don't know how to get into programs. Uh, so graduate students come and say, well, what's the process? I don't know. Because my process to get into my PhD was I went to a meeting. I was doing literacy. There was a graduate, super, or a graduate person from the University of Saskatchewan. Somebody said, he wanted to do his PhD. Talked to him for five minutes. The next day I got a phone call from my future supervisor, Dr. Caroline Tate. She said, let's go for coffee. We met for coffee. This was June 9th. And I think all letters and applications letters to go to PhD students were supposed to go June 19th or something like that, 10 days later. We met, had coffee, found out that I was friends with her nieces growing up because she's from McDowell, Métis from McDowell. And I got put into a PhD program 10 days later with full funding from the near centers too. So I don't know how that worked. <laughs> but the reality is I think it's all because of my topic. I had an understanding of what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to understand the ways in which indigenous men project their notions of masculinity and how the gang is involved with that. And I wanted to use photo voice. Because I thought photo voice would be a great method to begin to dig deeper. I didn't want to ask the questions to say, what does it mean to be a man? Because I can ask this question right now, what does it mean to be a man in this room? I guarantee we'll get the same generic sort of responses. Tough, independent, emotionless, uh, no fear, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than asking them what it is, I wanted them to show me what it is. What is this like? And I wanted to look at it to see how can photo voice actually create a, an emotive response that allows us to go beyond a tough guy's image, the image that is created through the media. So my research interests uh, with this book here, I have a chapter in there. A lot of my research interests focus on this idea of masculinity. And I use it now even to understand Indigenous women's involvement in street gangs. Because a lot of the research that we have with Indigenous women who are involved in street gangs focuses in and around this idea of sexual femininity, that there are sexual deviants going in there or they're used for sex and everything else. But what's interesting is when we talk with Indigenous women who are involved in gangs and not in the periphery but actually involved, their projection of identity is very much the same as the men. So they're practicing a female masculinity female street masculinity, uh, tough face, can't be emotional, um, but at the same time can't be emotional, but you have to be caring enough to protect your children. So there's these complexities that are going on when we look at it through an identity spot. So the book that's going around, uh, Brighter Days Ahead, uh, I'll give a quick little background about that, and so that everybody knows where it's coming from. Uh, I do community engaged research, and what I mean by that is that I work with the communities to begin to understand what do you need and how can I help you get there. And because I'm doing the PhD work, the reality is is that I got a lot of stuff out. I'm speaking here today because of that. If I didn't have the men in that book, I wouldn't be here right now. So we have to look at how to give back reciprocity. I'll show you a model here in a little bit. But part of it was they wanted to give something back to the community and that's what they did. They were tired of the media and all these other people saying how bad of individuals they were. They said they don't even know who we are. So that's where the book comes from. The book is a construction of their narratives through the interviews that have worked together to create the narrative, their life history, and it doesn't talk about their life in the gang. It talks about their life before the gang. What was going on in their life? Where are you? 
how do you feel when you're in school? How do you feel when you're moved around 30, 40, 50 times within the child welfare system before you're 12 years old? What does it feel like when you're 12 years old going into an institution for the first time? Hearing those doors sound, being arrested. So that's what it's, what it's about, how they've come to understand their spaces and their ideas of masculinity. And right now I'm working with women to do something similar. Because what happened with this research is that I was working through an organization straight up, which is an intervention program in Saskatoon. And they, I was working with the men, and I worked with men primarily first because of the gender issue. I didn't want to get caught up in these ideas of gender and that, because I even went through this with the ethics board. They thought I was going to be using the women because they were seen as um, sex workers in the eyes of the ethics board so that I would be manipulated by them or I was manipulating them for sex. So that's how I had to negotiate the ethics board afterwards. Um, so I said, let's work with the men first and whatever I screw up on, then we'll fix it for your research. We'll make it better for you. Because the guys are easy to mess up on. It's fine. <laughs> so that's now right now I'm working with the women to go through that and they wanted to give something back to me. Um, with that book, all proceeds go back to the organization. I don't get anything. Um, and you can order it through them. They have all rights to it. My, the only reason why my name's on it and their name's not on it is because I was told, because I had to get this done before I wrote my PhD, and I couldn't use it in my PhD, I had to put my name on it for copyright so that I could use the narratives and the photographs in my PhD. So that's uh, how it works out. So that's why my name's on it, not straight up. With the women, all the women's names are going on the book on how they want to see it. So that's a little bit about me um, and everything else. So that's how I got interested into gangs, and we'll get back into this in a little bit here. But before I get going through, one of the things we have to understand uh, with Indigenous street gangs is that in Canada and Australia, they're more they're a recent phenomenon. We're not talking about gangs that are going back, like in the United States, like the Latino gangs, uh, back into the Zoot Suits and everything else, um, or even further back to the Irish gangs in the 1840s, 1840s. Uh, 1890s and so forth. We're talking about gangs that have only been, really been around in our consciousness for about 30 some years in Canada and Australia for Indigenous street gangs. New Zealand's a little bit more of a phenomenon, is a different phenomenon. They have been around since the 1950s, 1960s. And the reason what they formed was they were forming out of the civil rights movements out of the United States and they themselves were forming to say we need to push for Maori rights. However, the individuals who were there, uneducated, and were in street involved within that space, they said, we need to do this from a different perspective. So they actually started from a point of fighting back. They were tired of the way the state was treating them, so they began to use um, a formation of civic pride, I guess, if you will, but also shock value. So if you look at it, it's a mongrel mob member. Has anybody ever seen a double lightning bolt side by side? Yes? Okay, what does the double lightning bolt mean? Because I know some people know and some people don't know. What's that? The SS. The SS, which is what? Yeah. yeah, Nazis. So what's interesting here, we have a white supremacist group uh, symbol on the helmet and the patches of the Mongol mob, a Maori group. And see, what they did at the time was they actually began to use these as a shock value because they were trying to shock society to say, look at us. We're here, and we will mess you up. Like they wanted to create a fear factor at the same time, because what they were saying, speaking with Nani Tarihi, who was a at the Survivors Survivance Network piece, who was one of the founding women of the Mongrel Mob, she was saying that we were using this symbol because we wanted people to recognize us, but we also wanted people to fear us, because for a lot of times the idea of people ganging up on us was happening, and we wanted to instill fear within the Pakia population. And so that's why they began to use symbols from the Nazi, because they said, how much more fear can you get into a society than using the Nazi symbols? So they actually began to embody them as a fear piece, but didn't practice white superiority, because it actually went against them themselves. But we also see with the black power, which grew out of the Mongol mob, the raised fist, just like the civil rights in the United States um, with the Black Panther movement. And so we see the adoption of uh, symbols by different gangs in New Zealand. And what's interesting about New Zealand gangs is because they've been around for so long, they've had so many generations that have gone through, they have individuals who are actually in government, uh, who are fighting for rights within their communities. 
Um, they are fighting for men's rights, they're fighting for women's rights, they're fighting for economic development, they're fighting for education. So to consider them as a violent street gang that they don't, aren't organized in a political means goes against what they're trying to do. There are violence pieces to it, don't get me wrong about that, but we have to, if we start looking at them the way this is constructed, we can begin to understand maybe gangs aren't all that bad. Maybe there's something else that's going on here. And so when we start looking at indigenous street gangs in Canada, I put this side here with the Indian Posse, because the Indian Posse in Canada was seen as one of the first indigenous street gangs to form on the streets of Winnipeg. And they formed because it was uh, brothers and cousins and friends who grew up in very hostile environments. We're talking about kids who were in the foster care system, who had kin relationships, um, we're seeing violence being done onto their mothers um, in their community, and they began to say, well, how do we begin to fight back? Because if I see an individual here and there's three people, and I come and beat the crap out of you, how do you begin to defend yourself? You get to band together. You find others who have a common history that you have, common goals and everything else, so you begin to band together, and that's what they did. They began to band together under a banner. And what they said, um, it's been noted by Comac uh, and their book, and Indians Were Red, Jeff Friesen, who wrote the ballad of the uh, Wolf Brothers, Daniel Wolf, is that they began to form under the color red because Indians are red, so Indians wear red. And so the color red is associated to the Indian Posse and a whole bunch, uh, bunch of different other indigenous street gangs. But there was also a credo when they started. There was, uh, they said that when we start doing this, because we are indigenous, we are entrenched in racialized poverty within the urban spaces of Winnipeg. Who wants to hire us? Who would hire an indigenous kid? A First Nations kid? How many people in the 1980s would say, oh, sure, let's go hire a visible First Nations kid in the hood for a job? No. So you have limited economic opportunities. <coughs> but we also have to understand within uh, the street, we have an illegal street economy where we have millions of dollars being cycled through these, mm -hmm. that, within these uh, communities. And we live in a capital society that says you need that iPod, you need that. Um, we also live in a space where we know through Cindy Blackstock's work that's beginning to come out more and everything else, that indigenous children are taken from their homes more due to poverty than for actual violence being done onto the children. So if I'm a single mother living in a community and I have to show that I have food and everything in here but I can't get a job because of a bunch of other things that are going on, how do I maintain protection of my children? Go to the illegal economy. Find a way in which to do that, because that way, at least you're keeping your children with you. So there's different things that are happening here. So they banded together, but one of the things that they said was no drugs were to be sold to women, children, elders, and especially pregnant women. No violence was supposed to be done around children, uh, elders, and pregnant women. That what they were doing was they were protecting themselves because there's other people coming into the community selling drugs and causing violence, that they wanted to resist back, they wanted to push back. And so that's how the Indian Boss began to form. So pretty easy to bring individuals in when you start seeing this violence being brought onto them. Then in the 1990s, one of the policies that was done in Manitoba was that we're gonna house all gang members in the same institution. In 1993, there was a riot at Headingley Institution, and they realized that they made a mistake. Because this riot went on for three days, they said, oh crap, we can't keep all the gang members together in an institution because they have too much control in the institution. So then they changed the policy and said, okay, we're going to spread them out so they have, don't have the same control. So they took the Indian Posse leaders and they said, okay, we're going to spread them across Canada um, to say, you don't have control. We've got to remember, this process of removing indigenous peoples and moving them across Canada has been going on for almost 100 years prior. Residential schools and everything else that's going on. So we, there's an understanding of kin relationships when this happens. So the Indian Posse members get brought across Canada, and what happens is the Indian Posse becomes the largest street gang in Canada in the 1990s, and it's been the only gang to actually reach coast to coast, north and south. It's the only gang to be able to do that. The Hells Angels haven't even died yet. The Hells Angels aren't found in all provinces. So this becomes the interesting fact, is around the way in which policy in which we control indigenous bodies, and how the gang becomes a, another symbol in which to do surveillance on indigenous peoples as an act of removal. Because if we say that they're gang members, then we can create policies, policing policies, to watch them. 
but we can do this in an unracialized way without saying we're focusing on race. We're focusing on gang members. They're fearful. This picture here was taken, and the photographs that I'm putting up here, outside of these two, are all photographs that people have taken for me and have given me permission to use when I do talks. So I, I have their consent uh, for doing this. This photograph here, um, five, five, 10, 15 minutes before that, that was a group of friends. This is the first photograph that they took as a gang. So what happened was this is a group in Saskatoon, uh, one of the fastest growing street gangs in Saskatoon, uh, in northern Saskatchewan, and been, been moving into the north and everything else. This is a group of friends who were hanging out, who were involved in the illegal economy, uh, selling drugs and everything else. But we had different street gangs coming in. We had Indian Posse coming in, we had Saskatchewan Warriors coming in, Native Syndicate coming in, and they were pushing this group of friends uh, outside. And most of these guys are Métis. All the other gangs are First Nations. So what they, they, they decided to do was like, to help us, we're going to form our own group. And what they did was they were sitting around and they were listening to uh, Fat Joe. Anybody remember the <laughs> rapper Fat Joe? Yeah, this is pretty funny here. What's Fat Joe's group's name? Oh. I just told you what their name is, so obviously you should figure that out. Uh. The Terror Squad. Because they liked Fat Joe and what they were listening to and the Terror Squad was there, that's how they got their name. They found, they formed their name under this thing that says, okay, well, look at this. We are the terror squad. Because it's fearful, it's something that it is, and we are going to impose terror on anybody else in the community. So this is where it is. But look at that. That's 15 minutes ago, they were just a group of friends and cousins. Now, they identified themselves as a gang. But what we have to understand, too, is that the macro-historical, macro-structural things that have happened allowed them to come to that space. It forced them to come into the space to either say, we will go with everything that's going on and we'll, sub we'll subsume ourselves to everything that's happening, or we're going to resist this. We're going to go against it and we're going to survive within these new spaces. When we look at uh, research on indigenous street gangs, and this is why I use photo voice, primarily a lot of it is done through quantitative surveys or uh, secondhand sources. So we'll go and ask police officers, social workers, prison guards, what do gangs do, what is going on. And we, and we continue to get this narrative, narrative that um, they're looking for a sense of belonging, that um, they don't know who they are, so we've got to create cultural programming for them. Um, and we create positivistic uh, theories around it, uh, the criminal justice theories, such as labeling theory, control theory, um, et cetera. Um, and so, what the guys talk about, uh, and these are men's right here, is that yeah, they experience a lot of poverty, there's a lot of violence going on, um, the lifestyle at the beginning they thought was clean and everything, now they're going back and it's dirty, a lot of trash in the neighborhoods. But it's this right here that lured all of them in. How long do you think it took this guy to make that much money? One hour. It's two hours. Guess how much he had to do to do that? Let's take a guess. I know. Two hours. So he makes this much money in two hours. He didn't move from that spot. <laughs> a hand came down. A bag came into his hand. He opened it up, closed it, grabbed the bag, put it up, and money came down afterwards. That's how it worked. So when we look at this, if you're in a neighborhood where you can't get a job, you're 16 years old, you can't go work at Tim Hortons, you can't go work at McDonald's, you can't go work at a, a minimum wage job because what are, the, what are the assumptions that we have of indigenous people, mm -hmm. especially indigenous men? What are, the, what are those stereotypes that we have of them? They're thieves, they're going to steal from you. What else? What else do we have to know about indigenous people? Yep. They're unreliable over there. Yeah. Yeah, unreliable, so we're thieves, we're unreliable, you get your first paycheck, you'll never be back, um, you're lazy, you're never on time, yep. Yeah. One thing I hear a lot is they're angry, they don't want to work with you, that kind of, yeah. yeah. So they're, they're poor workers, all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when we have all of this happening, so we have these racialized stereotypes, we know through studies that uh, 
and this is done in the United States more than in Canada, but we do know that if we put black sounding names onto resumes, and they have very good resumes, that we know that they're thrown into the garbage right away, even because they're not reading that, because they don't have the right name. So we already know that we've socialized ourselves to say, okay, who is it that we want to put in there? Let's go on to the prairies. If you see a First Nations name or an Indigenous name on a piece of paper for a resume, thief, stealing, it's a criminal, something's wrong with this person. I don't want to hire them. And you can slide it over to the side, even know that there is maybe well done. So we see this entrenched racial um, racialization happening across Canada. And it's not new. So I use this in my classroom on the idea of supporting settler colonialism. Because when we look at colonization and colonialism, one of the things is that we think of it as it's something in the past. That it's an event that we've already gone through and we just have to fix those little past things. We ignore that it's an actual process that continues today. So we have an ideology started way back in the day, but we see it entrenched within the Indian Act and everything else that we need to enfranchise, we need to civilize these indigenous, quote unquote, savages. And we can go look at work by Emma LaRock, uh, the Civ Sap dichotomy, and how the media played into all of this. But we have these ideologies coming. So if we look at indigenous peoples as uh, uneducated, take uh, Francis Widdowson, Howard, Flanagan, that they're primitive in their knowledge, they're primitive in their thinking. Well, let's create policies, let's create residential schools. Right? We need to get the Indian out of them. So we create that. What are the outcomes of residential schools? We know what's happening with all of that. So now we go up to here again. Indigenous peoples to be feared, they're uneducated, look what's going on. So now if we're feared, and if we move into today's kind of contemporary space, the gang is something to be feared. So if we can put the gang up here, if they're not ideology of something to be feared, and on the prairies we know that more indigenous men and women are involved in gangs, then we can create policies. Let's create policies on how to remove individuals, create new surveillance tactics, new policies on how to control. So now we can survey indigenous peoples without saying that we're actually watching indigenous peoples, we're watching gang members, right? Because if I'm watching gang members, I'm protecting you, the community, from these gang members. And don't worry, it's not just you that I'm protecting, I'm protecting the community where the gang members are in from the violence that these gang members are going to do. So that increases, what's the outcome if we start watching? If I tell you that there's somebody going to walk to the door right away who's very important, what's your focus going to be on now? Is it going to be on me or is it going to be on the door? It'll be on the door. So if we say that this is where gang members are, if we're going into the West Flat and saying this is what we've got to look for, the behaviors we've got to look for, we're going to focus on these bodies, we're going to arrest one. Who's the fastest growing incarceration rate in Canada? Indigenous men. Indigenous men continue to be one of the fastest, a growing um, incarcerated rate. 28, 29% federally incarcerated people are, are First Nations Indigenous peoples, those who identify for less than 4% of the population. Wow, they're committing crimes. See, it goes right back. They just don't, can't live in our society. They just can't be there. So we need to remove them some more. So we go into here, supports the ideologies, come down, Policies, let's remove their children because that's they're causing the issues. They're going to teach their children child welfare policies. Kids come in here, I don't know who my family is, uh, build kid relationships, go into the ideology, and we have a cycle. And this is a cycle that continues today, and this is what settler colonialism is. This is, in a nutshell, what we look at when we're looking at what settler colonialism is. Yeah? Sorry, it's a bit of a related question, but when you, when you, in discussing with the um, indigenous gangs, is their setup a bit very similar to some of the gangs that we that are more in the popular culture, the Bloods, the Crips, the Madastuchnia? Okay, like, right okay. Yeah. because if, I was just wondering if you're saying they're you know they have this indigenous identity. I was wondering if the gang setup also reflects that a bit more, if it's more traditional. Okay, yeah, yeah. we'll get into that right away. So this all sets up the whole thing around photo voice. Why I want to use photo voice? One of the things is that within photograph research around street gangs. Uh, this is what I was afraid I was going to get. I, th I thought I was going to get this media-generated image of the gangster, the tough Im image going through. But the reality is, is that even though that these look like that tough guy image, that tough image that needs to be uh, projected, the narratives behind that are very different. They're portraying, they want to say something very different than what's happening. Um, this is a research model. We can go back to that if you want later, but I'm just being, trying to be cognizant of the time um, and everything else. When we talk about the life within the street gang, when individuals began to talk, they talked about the life and the life. 
So the life is the actual reality that they were living in, and the life implications is that media-generated life, that gangster party hip-hop thing that we get from MTV. Um, but what else is interesting is that we always see the hood as being a place of deviance, of death. And this woman took a picture here, and this was painted on the highway, on the road um, in Regina, and it said, Tanse, it's good to be alive. We're in the middle of the hood. Because that's what it is. We're alive. We're not going anywhere. We are alive in these communities. And we're not all deficits. All of us are surviving in different ways. And we need to be able to show that. Um, these, are narr these are stories about the, an individual. Uh, she was taking all of it. She was part of all these drug busts that were going on. But they do talk about the extreme violence. But we have to understand violence in the space that the violence actually wasn't going on everybody in the community. The violence was associated very smallly to those who were involved in the gang. Because if I attack an individual who had a reputation, I was gaining their reputation. Um, the other part is shoes. Shoes mean different things in different communities. And this is what we have to be very cognizant of about gang culture. Gang culture isn't the same across every single space. That the shoes in this community right here, um, a death occurred, and is that this community? No, uh, that's in that one. Just wanted to look at the, the thing here, right here. Uh, so in this community, the shoes were thrown over top because they were wearing the wrong colors, and it's a warning for others not to go into that territory wearing those colors. So it becomes a street code that individuals have to go. In another community in Saskatoon, when you see shoes over top, primarily what it is, it's a commemoration to an individual who died there. And so they throw the shoes over top to commemorate that this color and this is what happened here. So there's a narrative behind each pair of shoes that go up. When we look at the lifestyle, when we look at a lot of the literature around street gangs, they'll say there's, you're, there's no way out of a gang, that the only way out is death. And some of the individuals talked about it uh, within here. But some people talk about the, the interesting relationships between police. Um, the woman who took this photograph here, her child was killed by the police. And I'm not saying a child as in 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years old. I'm talking about a two-month-old baby. We go back here. We see this drug bust. That was her house that got booted in. It was in February. It booted in the house. And she had her child in a car seat because she just got out from outside. And the cold air was going on to the child. The child, uh, she got handcuffed on the ground. She was telling the cops, like, cover up my baby, move my baby from the door. And they were saying, stop resisting and they started to kick her on the ground um, and everything else that was going on and she was just screaming trying to get to her child because it's minus 30 weather with cold air coming onto the two month old baby. We know that that's not good. But the police officer said you shouldn't have been doing what we were doing then. So they're punishing the mother while the child's there. A week, about a week after that incident, uh, she was out on bail, had her child, everything else, the child started coughing, she went to the hospital. Doctor at the walk-in clinic said, go to the hospital, get a chest x-ray. Uh, we think your child has bronchopneumonia. Goes into the hospital, doctor sees her and says, get out. We have listen to every indigenous mother who came in here. We would be so busy that we don't want to see you. Kicked her out. Child kept coughing. Went back the next day. Brought her husband, um, street husband. Not married husband, but street husband with her. Big, huge, native guy, gang colors all the way through. Going in there, asking for it. Called security, got escorted out. Child is still going, so this is on a Saturday. Sunday goes back and says the same thing. Got escorted out by security again. Monday morning, at four in the morning roughly, child starts losing breath. She rushes to the hospital, goes in there, child dies. Bronchial pneumonia. Child would have lived if the hospital would have let her in on a Friday. She got charged for the death of her child for negligence that was happening. Um, they went through, they find out that this all went on, charges got dropped, nobody got charged in the whole thing. Police officer held on to uh, everything that was brought in from the house, they went in there and took everything, uh, the baby bottles, baby blankets, all of that, kept it in evidence, and he harassed her until Christmas Day and then dropped the box off at her house on Christmas Day, telling her, why don't you just leave, her, leave your guy, come with me. He's a loser, come with me. So he was using his position of authority to try and get her away from the life, but was doing it to sexualize her, like to actually have sex with her and create a relationship. 
That all came from that picture. So this is the power that we can have when we start using photo voice and we build ethical relationships with people, when they begin to trust you about what happens. When we look at surviving, uh-oh. Anyways, well, let's see. Oh, hopefully it'll just cancel. Oh, no. So when we look at the child welfare, if you look in that book, almost every single gang member that I've ever met, we see residential schools as, as a cause for gang membership. I'm not saying it's not a cause, but I'm saying that is more impactful is child welfare. The movement and shifting of individuals. On the street alone, an individual was in three different homes on that street at different times. He was moved 30 times through his childhood. Before he was 12, and then he was put in the justice system. A woman took this picture here, and you can't really say it, see it at the back, but what it says is save from sin. She began to talk about the impact that, Chuck, that colonization and settlement has had on her and her family. She said, my father, my mother, they were taken, they were taken from us into a residential school because we were sinning. So that's what this is for. And she said, today, all our bodies are for sale. Indigenous women's bodies in our community, this is what they are, they're for sale. And she put her daughter in there, she said, this is how young they are for sale. Another woman talked about how her sister, her half-sister, was being sold to doctors for pills. So we have medical doctors buying First Nations children for sex, for drugs, for that community. This is reality. The thing is, is I would never have asked those questions. And that's the power, and that, again, that goes back to the power of photo books. I would never have known to ask those questions. These are the stories that come out of here, uh, within that. This is a school. This is where an individual started to talk about how he spent, he was the only Aboriginal kid in a all-white school, and he spent three years, was basically three years of his education there underneath the principal's window during recess, so he didn't play with any kids, because every time there was a fight or something, he would get in trouble and go to the principal's office, so he just found out the best place to be was underneath that window. Don't move, stay there. His desk was not even in the classroom. They moved him out of the classroom and out in the hallway, and he spent his classroom time out in the hallway by himself. What does that do to your identity? What does that do to you as an indigenous kid in an all-white community saying, you're the bad one, you're the bad one, you're the bad one? How long does it is until you begin to assume that identity and say, fine? And as one individual said, if you want me to be an Indian, I'll be the best damn Indian you can be. And that's what he did. He began to take on that identity. When we look at this, it's more than meets the eye. We look at that, we take this image, I can basically take this image and just put it into any newspaper and say, here, we've got gang issues going on, and look at the violence that they're doing, right? Look at that picture. Violence without a gun. When this picture came out, I was like, okay, what are you going to tell me? How good you were with a gun? Sure, he did. He said it's more than that. He ended up fighting his higher-up to get out of the gang. He stabbed his higher-up seven to ten times, almost killed him. Higher up came, survived, came to him and said, you're dead. We're going to kill you. And it was outside of the courthouse that this happened. So he moved out, moved into a house, uh, had a son, and all the doors had locks on it, all the windows were blinded down. He said he was Picasso with a gun. He could do whatever he wanted with that thing. He could paint a picture of a thousand words with that gun. What he did was he slept next to it for two years. But again, if we're dealing with trauma and somebody's going to kill you, how often do you sleep? Very rarely. So he's battling insomnia that's going on here. So he's half awake, half asleep for two years. His son jumps up on his leg and grabs his leg while he's sleeping one day. He pops up the gun and puts it right in his son's face. So he almost blows his son's face off with that gun. He said that was the last time. He took it, got a hacksaw, hacked that gun in half. That was his baby. He was never going to touch that gun. Hacked it in half, threw it away, took all the locks off his doors, opened up his windows, and he said, if they're going to come after me, they're going to come after me, but I will not hurt my son. And so he began to take the ownership of everything he did and say, I will own up to all of this, but I cannot let my son go through this. this. I cannot hurt him in the same ways. This is where police officers and gang members drop off women outside the city. Uh, this poll, this is where she got uh, into the gang. She was looking over top. There was a rumor going on that she, uh, she did something. She thought she was going to die there. So she was looking over top of this thing, and she was putting her head down. She talks about this entire story, and she heard the guy go back in the truck. She 
She knew he had a gun in there. She was waiting for it, waiting for it. Never came. She turned around, and there was a bandana for her. He said, here you go, you're part of it, sis. And so they gave her the bandana right there. But it's also the place where police officers will drop off women who are in the street lifestyle to get back into the city. This one here, she's walking along, and as you can see, kind of a happy sort of thing, and she says, this is the life that we live. There is happiness, but it's a wall. Like, we don't have a lot of room to go onto that side. And this is how thin this decision is to go here or to try and be on this side. It's a very small decision to be happy or on the street. And so she uses this as a metaphor to talk about that, but she also talks about this house and how she was raped in that house and how it was the street that protected her from being raped again. When we look at this, uh, research within street gangs talk about this idea that once you're a gang member, you're always a gang member and you're always banging. You're banging 24-7, 365. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The reality is, it is not. It's so actually boring research. Gang research is the most boring research you can do. I'm telling you that right now. And not because I don't want anybody to do it because I want to hold on to it. I'm actually telling you right now that it's really, really boring. I want more people to do it. But there's kids, their dads, their partners. The guy with the gun, that's him and his son. That's the son he almost took away from himself. Uh, this image here, he was one of the leading IP members in Saskatoon for a while. That's his son right there. It's the last image he has of his son. His son died three months later due to uh, cardiac arrest as a result of drug, taking drugs. But his son, you see here, he was in the street gang. He was following his dad because he was following his dad's image. Right? A lot of us follow where our parents go for. He was, so he was trying to replicate that. The idea of fathering and uh, giving birth. So what's interesting here uh, is that a lot of people think that, okay, once you're pregnant and you're in the street gang, you're getting kicked out or they don't want you in there. What I, all the women were telling me was that when they found out they were pregnant, the people of the gang were happy for them. They were supportive. They were out there, sounds bad, but they were out there stealing to get prenatal vitamins for the women to have so that their babies could be healthy. Like, so we're talking about individuals who may not have the money to go buy prenatal vitamins and individuals stealing and using the illegal economy to support the birth of a child, so coming around as a community within that. The other part is culture. A lot of the individuals will talk about, um, talked about that they knew their culture, they know who they are, but the reality is what they said is culture doesn't put money on our table. So uh, this one woman said, I, whenever I was having a lot of trouble, I would always go back to the community, I would always practice culture. When we go to cultural events, there are different gangs walking around. We just respect the space for it. We don't go and fight because we're at a cultural event. It's not like that. We respect the space and we take a note of who's there and then we go and figure things out afterwards. When you look at the gang, it's all about this. It's all about creating a mask. And that's part of being into the gang or getting introduced to the gang. Not everybody can be a gang member. Not everybody can be a gang member. Not everybody in the West Flat who's Aboriginal. Because the reality is, I don't want everybody to be in my gang. I want individuals who are tough, who aren't afraid. Because they need to create a legendary status. They have to have a status within the community. If they don't, why do I want them? So we test individuals as they go through. We talk about, you'll see news articles that say gang members as young as nine years old. They're not in the gang. They're being introduced to a street code and they're watching them. They're watching them to do certain things, right? So the guys are talking about the ways in which they would do this. They would set up fights for a 12 year old at a party and they would sit back and watch that 12 year old. And they expected the 12 year old to get beat up. And what they did was they wanted the 12 year old to get beat up because they wanted to see what they did afterwards. Did they run away and cry? If they ran away and cried, don't want them. Did they stand up and dust themselves off? It's okay, we're going to start watching them. Did they beat the crap out of those individuals? Yes, well, that's a guy that we definitely got to watch. So that's what they're doing. So there's these little tests that go through. And if we continue this idea that it's poor, racialized individuals, then these communities would create broad stroke approaches to address the issues, 
And we say everybody in the community is at risk when it's not. It's very few that can actually do it. And the reality is, is that most people, when they're involved, they make sure their brothers and sisters don't get involved once they're involved. Um, I won't talk about that. Again, I'm pausing the time. When we look at the structures within the gang, there's different ways. Um, it's kind of traditional in a, in a sense that when we look at AJ, Hell's Angels, no women are really involved with the Hell's Angels within the couples and everything else. When we look at Indigenous street gangs, we have a gendered piece that happens. For a lot of the street gangs, um, when I talk to the women and the men, they'll talk about women being involved. And for some of the street gangs, you couldn't actually sit on the council unless you had a woman. You had to have a, ma a male and a female. And there's two reasons, for, there's a couple reasons for that. One of the reasons is that if you go back in the 1980s, 1990s, um, police officers couldn't really go and pat down, because there's more male police officers, couldn't really go pat down a woman. So who would you get to hold, if you're carrying illegal goods, who would you get to hold your stuff? A woman. So, oh, women are drug mules. They're the mules of the gang that are going to be transported into drugs, and so we see this as a subservient thing. The reality is, it was a conscious decision for the women to hold it, because if they didn't, the guy would be arrested and be taken away, and there goes our money. So they made that. So what's happening now within indigenous street gangs and more ethnic gangs with, across Canada and the United States is we're seeing a lot more white-skinned people being involved. They're the ones who are carrying the drugs now. Because the police officers won't stop me, they'll stop my cousin who is darker than me about drugs and I'll just be, get out of here. You're not, a, you're not supposed to be in this neighborhood, get out of here. But we're going to stop the person who looks like that gang member. So gang members are actually using gender and race as tools because they're playing off of the racial and gender discrimination that we've seen in our society. They're watching. They're paying attention in all of this. So within the structures, one of the things, I know that's, that's what you're saying, I don't, I don't see Indigenous street gangs as this top-down, mm -hmm. real sort of structured sort of thing. What I see them as, more rhizomatic, if you will. That these gangs are, again, you see this distribution going out. When we look at indigenous street gangs, one of the biggest things, it doesn't matter if you're in Australia, New Zealand, or Canada, kinship becomes the, the main focus. What does kinship mean? Kin doesn't just mean brother, sister, it means the relation. So if I'm in the child welfare system and we have these kids moving around back and forth, <coughs> we build kin relationships with individuals. They get out and they go out into the space. Wow, there's Kinless over there. Hey, Kin, how you doing? Remember back when? Yep, here we go. We have a relationship. One of the street gangs, um, actually in the 1990s, had a network where they would go from Vancouver and work their way through. And in every town they went to and every city they went to, because of kinship, they had a place to stay. And so they were. there's a network of transportation. But this shouldn't be news to any of us because pre- contact, we had these trading networks that were going across the country, north and south anyways. It's almost a, rec a reclamation of these traditional kin relationships and networks that are going on. So that's where we begin to see this happening. Um, violence and trauma. And I just want to do this about photo voice. So photo voice is you give cameras to individuals to go and take pictures and it comes back to you. Wang did this with uh, uh, Chinese women, rural Chinese women, where it first started, and it was to do, deal with literacy. Um, because the women weren't giving the answers she was looking for, and so she began to redevelop sort of a way in which they can start talking to them. So photo voice is emancipatory. It's supposed to be transformational, where the uh, photographer, photographer, controls the narrative, right? Well, what happens when you can't move in your community? So photo voice, as a researcher, we're supposed to be objective. We don't want to be a part of it. Well, objectivity in research is a hogwash, in my opinion. Everything is subjective. I had to modify it. And what I did was I modified it so that, because some of them wanted to go to communities that they didn't have access to or they couldn't drive to, so I would drove, I drove them around. And this is where this happened. The individual I was with uh, wore all black. This is red, you know, colors mean different things. So they're at war at the time, the two colors are at war. 
We go down there, as we're driving down, he tells me the story about what happened, the violence that was happening in his community, actually how he was afraid to go into the community. He's like, I think this is a bad idea. He's like, no worries, we won't even stop, we'll just turn around. He's like, no, I want to do this. He's like, just drive to the community though. So it's a Sunday morning at about 9 in the morning, we're driving around, beautiful fall day, driving around the neighborhood, not getting the pictures he wants, and um, part of it is, is that, he's like, okay, I can't get it. And he said, okay, let's just stop, we're going to walk, because we didn't see anybody. So we got out of the vehicle, and he said, listen, if anything happens, you run as fast as you can into whatever building you can get into, and don't worry, I'll find you later. I was like, okay, I grew up in the West Lot of PA, I'm okay, like, I, 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 I'm understanding violence now. And he looked, and he's like, no, I'm serious. And he looked down, and I was wearing flip-flops. And I was like, I am going to run that fast. And he looked down, and he's like, at least I can beat you, that's all that matters to me. And so I was like, okay, whatever. So we took a corner as we're talking about this, and three individuals, wearing all red, were right there. They came around us, surrounded us, looked down the street, there's a group of eight more getting out of a vehicle, all wearing red. He's all black. What the hell are you doing in here? Get the F out of the community, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Trying to be a peacemaker, because that's what I like to do. Whoa, settle down. And we began a 15 minute conversation, telling what we're doing. I went into my hoodie and I grabbed a, a card, a business card, I'm like, here, I'm a university researcher, and I got it, but when I put my hand into my pocket, they stepped back and they lifted their hands up, and I was like, uh-oh, I'm like, whoa, whoa, okay. <laughs> then, and they're like, you got a camera? And he has his camera in his hoodie, and so he puts his hand in his hoodie, and once he did that, they lifted up their shirts and I could see metal behind their backs. I don't know if they were pipes or whatever it was, but I saw the metal on the back listening. I was like, okay, stop. I said, just grab the camera. So Dave grabbed the camera and said, here, look, we're just taking pictures and everything else. And he's showing them the pictures. They looked at it and they said, okay, what are you trying to do? I said, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to understand this masculine front that all of you are putting on right now. This is what I'm looking for. It's the perfect thing. And I said, do you guys want to pose for us? Like, this is what I'm looking for. I want you to pose. And Dave was like, yeah, can you pose because I can't put my face in here because of my job and everything else. And they're like, oh yeah. So the three of them, one guy said, sure, I'll pose, but I want to be on the cover of the book. So that's how I got the cover of the book. But what was even more interesting was two weeks later, I get a, uh, a thing from the RCMP in Regina saying, have you seen these individuals? Well, the guys who surrounded us were the president, the vice president, the sergeant of arms and they're all wanted for first degree murder, second degree murder, and manslaughter. So that's who surrounded us. What was even more interesting on the power that some of these gangs have in communities um, is that they said you got 15 minutes. And they were walking down the street and they began to walk in front of us. And people were coming out of their homes and they just went like this and they just pointed. And the people went right back into their homes and shut the doors. So they gave us 15 minutes to go down. The vehicle that was behind us, um, the individuals got out, came back in, and they drove down, and they started tapping on the windows when they went by us to show that intimidation, to show that fear, right? To try and take that away from us. But ethics had a fun time with me when I told them that story. They did not like that at all. Um, but again, this is how we have to, if we're going to be a community-engaged researcher, we have to engage with our community. We have to begin to work in the lived realities that they're working in. We can't assume that we know what's going on or where a research project's going to go. So in the end here, through the research and everything else, what we begin to see is that indigenous men and women, if they've been involved in street gangs, they're happy to be here. And they're, they know that they went through a struggle, and they're happy to be here now. I know I resisted, I'm still surviving, I'm still challenging the way things go. Some individuals have been brought back through culture, smudging ceremonies, uh, this individual here, his uh, brother died, so it's a commemorative tattoo that he wears with him all the time to remind himself of his brother who died. This is interesting here as a metaphor. The woman before this, she was running a gang house. Um, she was way up there in the gang house. The color was black, so all the walls were black, no blinds. She said nothing could grow in there. This is her new home, and she has a flower there, and she said, that represents life for me. It represents a new life. I get to grow things. Things are bright again. I get to see things from a different perspective. She, um, you, you may know her. She was part of the Working Miss Indigenous Women, Georgina's son. 
She is a recording artist. She works in the community. She's an activist um, now. Amazing woman. Um, children trying to be happy. What's interesting is we talk about gang members. This is the youngest guy that he interviewed. His sister was one of the murder and missing indigenous women. He was 21 years old and he was one of the biggest activists in Saskatoon looking for his sister. But he's a gang member. Interesting, isn't it? Gang members are supposed to be deviant in communities, but here we go. What's going on? There's other two things here. This individual who took this photograph here, again, I'm trying to keep time in mind here. Um, you see an eagle feather that's healthy and a, a braided sweetgrass. In the photographs before he was going through, he said my eagle feather was unhealthy and he brought in a kind of a broken one. He said it doesn't mean that I'm not indigenous or I wasn't practicing my indigeneity, it just meant that I wasn't healthy. I needed to find a new way. And so it was on top of the bandana. An elder came in and said that is disgusting. You cannot have ceremonial stuff on top of a bandana or a bandana close to it because the gang members bastardize our culture. I said, do you want to know what that picture means first before you start getting upset with the individual? And he's like, no, I'm, like, I'm going to tell you anyways. And I told him the story of what it means. And what this individual said is that <coughs> I'm healthy now in tradition because his grandparents were medicine people. He carried his traditions through, but he said, I can't leave the gang because the gang is my family. Not as a brotherhood that I found into, but the gang is my brother. The gang is my cousin. The gang is my sister. The gang is my family. So I can't separate myself from that because that's my family. That's who I am. And so he said, together, it doesn't matter. I will always support my family. But they know that I'm on a different path, that I don't want to be involved in this violence anymore. The other piece, if we continuously focus on the idea of culture as being this linchpin to bring the individuals out of the gang, we forget about the First Nations and Métis people who don't follow traditional values, who are Christians, and are devout Christians, especially Métis. Métis are Christians. Let's get that through ourselves. Métis are Christians. So what he did was he said, when people told me I was supposed to smudge to feel better, I didn't know what that meant. But I did know that I needed to pray. And I did know that I needed to be connected to somebody else. So as an indigenous man, he said, I am Christian, but I am still a First Nation sort of man. That does not change who I am. So when we look at programming, we've got to be very careful about saying that we have to include culture as the main point uh, when individuals who may be joining in are joining or don't see themselves in that cultural space. So we'll leave it there. Um, and any questions or comments that individuals have? Because I know we've got some other bit of time here. So. Um, if you have a question, please just introduce yourself in your, and then go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Jessica Kudeski. I'm a PhD student at the School of International Development and Global Studies. Sure. Um, I, I have so many questions, but I'll res restrict them to maybe like one and a 1.2. Um, in terms of how you used photo voice, uh, I'm so curious to find out how you managed to forge these relationships with the, with the subjects and the people that you worked with. I know you talked about kin and kinship and your background, but specifically about the individuals that you you came into contact and how and how you, you built that trust. I'm so curious. And secondly, a bit more sort of technical, could you explain a little bit the process in terms of uh, the length of time it required for them to go out and, and take their photos and then did you do like a, an individual <coughs> debriefing? Did you record their stories, you know, uh, written or, or with a recorder, things like that? I'm just really curious because I'm using this, this method sure. of my own research. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this is a relational accountability. Uh, so I've written on this, there's an article that I published on how I actually used uh, an indigenous methodology to engage with this research. And to be honest with you, in 2006 this all started. So I started my PhD in 2010, but in 2006 this model started to be able to actually work with indigenous men who were involved in gangs. And it started in 2006 where I met the founder of Straight Up, the organization that I went through, and he hated researchers. He absolutely hated researchers. He thinks that we are do nothing. You, you are the cause of the issues that I'm dealing with right now, is what he said. I was like, why? He's like, because you influence policy. None of you want to actually listen to the individuals that are here. You all think you know what's going on or what's best for them. He's like, okay, whoa, okay. Let's bring it back. Let's reel it back just a little bit. I said, sure, sounds good. 
But what I did was I started to build a relationship and I said, I don't even want to do research in your group. I said, here you go. Here's the University of Saskatchewan. There's a project going on here that is looking at literacy. They need uh, to do it in the inner city. You're an organization that works in the inner city. Here's a connection to get some money to support some economic development for your individuals. Here you go. So every time there was a project that was going on, I would bring them in. Then in time, in 2008, 9, there's a gang strategy that was going through and I was on it and he began to listen to me on how I was constructing gangs and he was, said, okay, come on board. I was brought on the board. I still haven't met one member of Straight Up yet at this time. And then when I told them what I wanted to do about this research, they said, okay. And two years later, I was able to actually do my first interview. They did the recruitment. They actually went about and said, okay, I want this person, that person, that person, that person, that person. Bring them into a room and said, here you go, talk. So I talked, done talking, I left. They all talked in the room, I came back in. Yeah, I'll do the research, I'll do the research. They needed the founder, Father Andre, to agree that I was okay to do research with him. So that's the model that went through. And it is all about respect. The first thing I had to do was show respect. I had to respect them, respect their boundaries, respect what's going on, and understand that in a lot of indigenous communities, Research sucks. Like going in there, the research sucks. But it's been a poor relationship in the beginning. It needed to be relevant. Part of straight up is that you have to tell your story. This is just a new way to tell your story. This is a new way for them to start expressing themselves and they're in through it. Had to be reciprocal. One of the biggest things that they said was, you're giving us $40, we get $100, and that's the other thing. I gave them digital cameras, mm -hmm. um, which ethics got really mad at. And I said, if I gave them disposable cameras, like most photo boys at the time were giving, I said, if I gave them disposable, they would drop them in the, ca in the can as soon as they left, and I would never see them again. And they said, no, they wouldn't. I said, just trust me on this, please. Just trust me. So they trusted me, and in their, our interviews afterwards, I said, what if I gave you a disposable camera? What would you have done? Throw in the trash. I was like, thank you. I was right. So, but what was interesting was, so this idea of reciprocity about creating honorariums for them, they actually asked the question, listen, you're giving us all this book, and you're making us, you're giving us a book, and you're helping us give back to the community, what are you getting from it? So they actually were more cognizant of this reciprocity than I really was at the time. I said, well, I'm going to get my PhD, give me stability, I said, oh, my, what I'm going to get and benefit from it is later on, where I'm able to go and talk across Canada, internationally about your life. And they were like, okay, sounds good. We're like, you're getting something, that's all that matters to us. Then it's responsibility. There are photographs and narratives that I cannot share. They have spe specifically stated you can use this to write and to think about, but you cannot actually put it into a paper. And so I respected that. The only photographs I show, the only narratives I talk about are those that the individuals have said you may share these to help educate people. <coughs> and so that's the responsibility. <coughs> Once it was done with the men and they saw how it was done, that's where the women came in. And they said, you know what, you did it in a good way. We want to be a part of this now. So that relationship keeps building and building with them. And so even though I'm not in Saskatoon anymore, I am in constant email with them. We have a policy coming down. Can you read this for us? We have a grant that's coming through. Can you read this for us and help us develop the grant? So yeah, that's what I do. I, mean, I have to keep that engagement going. You just don't end when a research project ends. The other part was this idea of ethical space. Willie Ermine's work, um, if any of you aren't familiar, I really recommend going read Willie Ermine on ethical space. He goes way beyond Sean Wilson's later work on it. But in here, this is where, even though I was an indigenous male coming in there, I wasn't an indigenous male. I, I am white skin, I'm white coated. I don't know what racism feels like. I know what exclusion feels like because when I was younger, like I said, I wasn't told to say anything, but I don't know what it's like to be stopped because of the way I look. I don't know what it's like to be followed by police officers in a mall. I don't know what it's like to walk into Canadian Tire and be looked at as a thief as soon as I walk in. I have that. I also grew up in a home, there was violence, but not the violence that they're talking about. Like, spanking was a normal occurrence in my home. Fighting was a normal occurrence in my home. But I'm not talking about violence where a six-year-old has to grab a knife and stab somebody who's raping their mother. I'm not talking about that much. So I didn't try and say, I know what you are. I know what it's like to be there, because I don't. 
I can only talk about what I know from and where it's from. And I think that's part of the indigenous piece of this. When you see indigenous peoples begin to talk in spaces, that's why bringing in where you're from and where you come from positions that, and you're honest about it. And to say, that is your story, that is where you're from, and this is where I'm going to work from. So we work through this idea of ethical space within that to create that dialogue. And so that's how all of that went through. Um, and what was the second part of your question? I think that's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll leave the time for others. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it looks like, um, like with the police dropping women off in the middle of nowhere, that's a common occurrence uh, all across Canada and small uh, Native communities. So I was wondering if you ever did anything working with the police on relation with gangs, no. and how they interact and or, or non interact. Yeah. Or choose. <laughs> uh, no, um, I, and one of the things is, is that I think part of the problem is even though that my, I have connections in with the police and everything else, I come at it from a very different spot. I don't think police have anything to do with the research that I focus on. They're suppression, and that's what it is. But what we're seeing with policing agencies is they want to control the prevention and intervention processes within that. And I actually work with agencies and I say, do not have the police come in right now. It's not, you don't, if you want to deal with street gangs, you don't deal with arresting them. You deal with the trauma. You deal with the addictions. If we can create programming around that, you're not going to have that. Because the reality is, is that we're dealing with violence in communities. The gang becomes an empty signifier to be applied to racialized groups to say we've got to fear them and it continues that. And so, but police don't like hearing that. Yeah. Police don't like hearing that you have racial, you know, Racist policy, like you, I used to teach in the College of Education on antipress education, and have nice students coming into the classroom. And I say, when you walk in through that door, how do you treat all students? All students are equal. So, so if your religion tells you that uh, being gay or lesbian is a sin, how are you going to treat those students who may identify in the LGBT community? I will never treat them differently. But you've already been socialized to that. How do you know you're not treating them differently? How do you know when we look at elementary, when we look at people moving classroom stuff around, who's asked to lift heavy things or to move things? The boys. The boys are the ones that are seen as tough. They're the ones who are moving things in the classroom. Even though at eight, nine years old, they're roughly the same strength, same size. But yet we socialize individuals to begin to think in particular ways. So when we start working with police officers, it's really hard to tell them, you know what, You're, you may actually be racist, in your thinking. Doesn't mean that you practice racism and you're part of this Ku Klux Klan and everything, but your thinking is racialized in this sort of way. How do we break that down? How do we begin to deconstruct that so that when you're working in there, that's what's happening? But again, the police officers have always told me, my brother, and this is why we get into some nice discussions with my brothers, um, it goes all the way back to that focus. Where does crime happen? And we look at social disorganization, we look at control theories, Social learning theories, they're all positivistic, always focus on the poor and the marginalized. That's where crime happens. Even though we know crime happens across communities, we will not put the same targeted initiatives to look at certain behaviors. And that's why I like using masculinity within this sort of research too. Right? If we have two boys on a hill in Prince Albert in the East Hill, white fighting, what are they doing? What does society think they're doing? Boys being boys. If I get two Aboriginal kids on the West Platte with Prince Albert fighting, what are they doing? They're learning how to be criminals. Same behaviors, different places, different bodies, different results. So as a society, we've got to break that out. And that's why separate colonialism is a better way to begin looking at this with the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. In my opinion, which can, you can throw out as soon as we walk out of here. It doesn't help. Yeah. Um. We see there's Question a lot. Over there too. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Please. Oh, I was just going to say, sorry, I thought you pointed to me. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't see okay. anything. So. Um, we see a lot, like on, you know, TV in the media, this glamorization of, you know, Pablo Escobar and some of the big Tukey Williams. And I was just wondering if um, Indigenous gangs have arrived a bit to that, where there's kind of these big shots and they're like laundering money. You know, they've kind of reached that sort of next level gang behavior, or is it still very small enough that it's kind of just very localized? Um, so one of the 
issues is that it goes back to that idea of the Indian policy being across the country. Mm -hmm. So we have indigenous street gangs that are across. Um, they're dealing in large mm -hmm. networks. Um, but the reality is, is they don't have the international connections because they don't have the actual economic pieces to actually move about like mm -hmm. those other individuals do. So it's very localized to a community, but it's not saying that there's a lot of money going mm -hmm. around. Um, guys were talking about how they would have stacked, like one guy said when the BC Lions were hosting the Great Cup, he took five friends on a plane, uh, took $20,000 cash with him, and went out there and partied it up. When we look at Indigenous street gangs, one of the problems is, is that most Indigenous gang members don't have a SIM card because they've never had to work. So they don't have a social insurance number. Without that, it's really hard to get a bank account. Uh, without that, it's really hard to get a job. And you don't have driver's license. But if you go into the hood, you'll see, um, <laughs> you'll see cars. So when you buy a vehicle, if I don't have a SIM card, I don't have a bank number, and I don't have a job, can I go into, um, car dealership and say, here, I want to go buy that uh, $90,000 vehicle. No, can't do it. So what do they do? They go on to Kijiji, they go on to Auto Trader and say, well, here, I, there's a $5,000 vehicle. Here's some money for that $5,000 vehicle. And then they'll put a $10,000 underkit on it um, to do it. So you have these little topazes that have these underkits underneath um, and rims on it. But the other part is that if I drive this vehicle, it's the same phenomenon in the United States, driving while black. If I'm driving a nice vehicle and I'm an indigenous, visibly indigenous person, I'm going to be stopped by the cops more often, even if I'm not doing anything. So why do I want that heat? So that's part of this whole thing, right? So it's really difficult to do that. And it's also hard to buy houses. So what happens is that there's usually one or two gang members that are business owners or have legitimate jobs and they'll buy houses as rental properties and they'll use the rental properties as the gang houses. And what they've done is that one house will hold guns. Because if you have guns, um, drugs, and money all together, you can be charged under organized crime. But if you have only guns in one house, only drugs in another one, and only money in the other one, you can't really get charged in that way. So you can go to one house, you sign a slip, you pick something up, go to another house, sign a slip, pick something up, and go around. So they're working within a system. When you look at how escort, like it's in the United States, the Navajo uh, around the border, yes, there's a lot more drug trafficking that's going across in large quantities. Um, you go out on the West Coast because of where it is, but we're also in a very central space, so it's a lot harder to transport things in the middle of the country, especially on the prairies. Um, so you have to, if you don't have those connections out there, it's really hard to get there. That being said, most often, if I have kid connections in the community, I have already built relationships. It's like building any business. If I have relationships in the community, I can do more business. So if I'm a larger Muslim Brotherhood over here, and I make a connection with the Native Syndicate, I'm going to supply you with everything. You go sell it, and you just transfer it this way. Mm -hmm. So it becomes like a more natural thing. That's basically where we see indigenous gangs in um, Canada and the US. New Zealand, a little bit different because of longevity that they're there, um, but at the same time, they're not this international mm -hmm. media projection of street gangs. That's mm -hmm. what I'm yeah. um, Now that you've started doing work with Indigenous women, mm -hmm. I know that we would all really like to read some of what comes out of it. When do you expect that you'll have either papers or maybe another book of photo voice or anything else coming out? Uh, the women's book I'm just finishing up right now with the women, um, they're signing off on their narratives because uh, what I do with the process is that even though I am given, um, and that's the Sims, that's that's for you stuff. For thanking me for coming in here, that's yours for the institution. Not sharing. <laughs> um, it, it'll come up, well, part of the process of doing that book was that at every level, they signed off and said yes. Uh, to give an example, uh, one woman who went to the narrative, there's a gang that's going through her community that's assaulting all Native Syndicate, and she's Native Syndicate, so she had to make sure there's no NS put into the whole thing. So it's, it's their, it's not mine, it's their so it's So hopefully by June I can get it off the press, because it's hard to find a couple of women. Lifestyle, right? They're not all doing well, not all doing bad. Uh, so hopefully by June that'll be going to the press. Uh, come out hopefully by August. 
September we print it. And again, you'll be able to order it through straight up, uh, and they'll have the copy. And it'll probably be around thirty dollars. Just with that one. Yeah. Kind of a segue into this time. Um, anyway, I'm John Lowe from the professor here. Um, when you do your real, real book with your name really on the cover for a reason, <laughs> um, I'm wondering, if, just as a suggestion for titling it. Um, if you could get resistance movement in there and put street gangs sort of underneath it or something, because that way, instead of feeding into prejudice, yeah. you'll be creating an interesting little debate in people's minds, you know? And that's what I've started in August with that symposium, is we're looking at across the countries is can we actually start using Gerald Bisner's uh, idea of survival, it's not Derrida's, but Gerald Bisner's idea of survival that has been used in literary, indigenous literary terms as an actual theory to begin to understand the realities that are happening today for indigenous peoples living in extreme racialized poverty neighborhoods. So, and that's how we're going to try and build it uh, within justice and health. So it's slowly building, um, but we'll get there sooner or later. And yeah, the book is going to probably focus around masculinity, about creating that tough image with, my, with the men's book. Yeah. Uh, um, do, do guys have the support of the uh Oh, uh, general First Nation community? No. No. No, for the most part, gangs aren't supported within uh, the general community um, because they're seen as taking away, as hurting the community. Um, and so some policies that are created around this are um, exclusionary, so the removal of individuals from reserve. So out west, one of the things that um, is being done is if you're caught committing a crime, we're going to banish you from the community and remove you from the community. But really, does that actually address, and I'm trying to work with Chief and the Council to say, is that actually addressing what's going on, or are we exasperating the issue into another space? The other part that I always ask is that if we're going to say that it's um, uh, belonging, like these kids just don't belong, so that that's why they're joining again, is because of a sense of belonging. And the question I always ask communities is if they don't belong, why aren't you letting them belong? And beginning to reframe the question onto the community. Because it's always them making the choice that they're going. The community is also making the choice of why we don't want, why we're excluding them. So it's to create that reflexivity, that ownership, that this isn't just a choice, that there's a lot of other things that go in, so, um, and that it's not just their choice, it's been the community's choice. Yes, yeah, I'm programming, I think, for that our dear child. And she was talking about Winnipeg, and it was, an, I'm pretty damn sure, an indigenous woman who was. Um, in danger of being killed by one of the gangs for, for I'm mean, forget exactly the what she had done to what bothered. Anyway, it's, but she got out of it and she had a, started an organization where if anything happens, like she's with a group, like there's, they find drugs on the street, I mean like where people selling or an abandoned house where there looks like there's people they report it to the um, Canadian police, I suppose. Yeah. And I suppose it's a, I mean it really hurts so it's a it's a antagonistic to the gangs. Well, and that's the thing, like there's a lot of things that are going on in communities, and I don't know the answer. And I don't know what communities, every community will have to develop their own ways in which to work with it, but it's got to be one that actually is a strength-based approach that the community can actually sustain and can and go by. And I think, when you look at the mongrel mob and the black power in New Zealand, I think those are good examples of how Gangs can be political organizations to actually fight for the communities. What we're actually want to do with the street gangs is actually, in my opinion, don't get rid of the gangs, get rid of the violence that's associated to it. I don't care if you're being in posse. I only care if you're going to commit violence. So if we're going to say we're going to remove somebody from a gang, then we better create another social network for them to feel like they belong somewhere, they kind of create a sense of identity. So if we can actually focus on violence, like I don't, the Hells Angels, I could care less if you're a Hells Angel. I just don't want the violence that comes if you're going to create violence in the community. Um, because we look at sports teams, I played hockey. We look at kids, bully groups, look at all of this. Like, the sports team is very much bullies in communities. They bully kids in high school, but they're positive. So we need to start working on this idea of violence. And I'd rather see, and that's why I work from a space of street lifestyles. I don't like using street gangs anymore. Um, these are from street lifestyles, because the gang, what it draws on is these particular groups, rather than focusing on particular behaviors such around violence and trauma.
You do whatever you want. Yeah, we've time for one more. It's a bit of a tangent. First, I just wanted to say thanks for that talk. It was super interesting research. Um, I think we could probably be here for another 20 minutes or so. Um, but I just had a question around gender. So you've raised the idea of gender a number of times in yeah. the talk. Um, and much of what you're talking about is really heteronormative. Yep. Yeah. And I'm wondering if in your research there's any discussions around two-spiritedness, two-spirited masculinities, what happens around that whole idea of being too spirit in street lifestyles? So part of that, um, within the gang, the gang space, uh, you're creating an image, so you're still creating that. Image. So when you look at the street space, it's a very hegemonic um, masculinity that's being constructed in there, where the gang is the top. And if you don't fit that image of what a gang member is, top, independent, you also have to be a sexual being in there as a male, then you're excluded outside of that. But when we look at it, it's not that two-spirit or those who are two-spirit are outside. Um, they may still be associated because they may have brothers and cousins that are part of that, but they might not just be able to be involved in the gang itself because the gang has an image to protect on the street. So if you're seen as taking, and that goes back to the whole thing, if you just take in anybody into your gang, you're actually disregarded on the street. So a lot of street gangs are actually getting smaller and smaller, and they're really localizing their... Um, who they have. If I have the toughest guys, the best drug dealers and all of that, I don't need a hundred little guys running around for me. Because I already know that I'm, I have the individuals, I have five guys and they have ten. We know what we're doing. We know what, because it's that street status that you're building. So when we look at the idea of two-spiritness, the women talked about same-sex relationships, but a lot of that was in building a sisterhood um, where they weren't involved in the gang, but they were involved in the street lifestyle and they were learning how to uh, keep this space and they were using um, uh, same-sex relationships as a protective tool from being sexually assaulted. <coughs> and, but what's interesting <coughs> is that they would always talk about the ways in which, even though they may be in same-sex relationships, they would use heteronormative, heteronormativity as a way to uh, do sex work to gain money for their relationship. So there was almost a an understanding that we are together, and you may have sex with a man, but that is a commodity exchange of capital to support us as a couple. And so it's not as divisive as male, female, same-sex relationships. But for the men, you know, you don't have the, the two-spirit same-sex part uh, within the gang. Or at least they don't talk about it. Well, part they don't talk about it, um, the other part is that when you go into jail, one of the biggest things to lose respect is to be dominated by another male uh, within there. So if you get um, uh, sexed in jail, you're seen as losing your status as a man. So you have to fight your way back into it. So that's the only way that this was kind of talked about was that if you were actually a taker, you aren't giving anymore. And so that you are seen as being less than. And right. so, so even, if, even if you're a top, you're still considered you're seeing the find as the way it is. So that's the only way that that was done, and it was done in a way that removed power. And it's interesting, because in um, the movie American Me, anybody ever remember that movie, American Me? Um, American Me? Anyways, <laughs> the one that was done about the Mexican Mafia uh, in the United States, uh, where the director or the producer was killed after they won an award, and it was based off of the individual's life, and there was a rape scene in there where the head of the Mexican Mafia was raped by Nortenios, and they said before it went out, we talked to you and said you cannot put that in there, and he did, to show like it's not as glamorous as you guys are trying to make it out to be, and he ended up dying uh, from a hit after he won the award, um, because it became this national sort of space. So uh, there's a very much a protectionism around that, because the way in which um, gay men are seen as being docile, um, and seen as being dominated rather than what they can do. It's not to say that the same test isn't there, it's just that it's not practiced. And if you practice it, you're up. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Oh, okay, thank you so much.